engineering and an MBA from Venezuela Polytechnic Institute. He's a graduate of Harvard Business School Advanced Management Program. He's also a New York registered professional engineer. So before I only introduce uh, Rana to take the stage, he's going to make this presentation ex without notes, without slides. And I think that's a welcome respite. And this way we are also open and Rana is willing to accept questions as he speaks. So um, again, uh, he'll, not, he'll talk normally for one hour and we'll have questions and answers for the remaining 30 minutes. Rana, the stage is yours. Thank you, Rudy. And again, I'm delighted to, the, to, to be at this forum. And I can tell you my first roommate in RPI was from Lehigh. So, and I've known many, many Lehigh students. So it's 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 great that to actually be invited to speak at uh, uh, speak at Lehigh. So as as Rudy said, I don't have any slides. I want to make this into a conversation. And and if you have any questions, just just put your hand up, and I can call on you, and I will, uh, and and you can ask me the question right away. So one of the things what's exciting is, you know, I started my career, <clears throat> I came from India in 1981 to RPI for grad school, and I did a master's in power, then I did an MBA, then I worked for GE and ABB and New York ISO, this has been a long haul, but, it, you know, when I started my career in the early 80s, power system was very, very boring, it was the fuddiest, duddiest field you could think about, it, because everybody was going into electronics and computers and and this was probably the most boring part of electrical engineering. But given after 40 years, this is the most cutting edge because energy, everybody, not even engineers, uh, all the young people are interested in decarbonization and sus sus sustainability in, in actually the survival of the planet because we are getting, it, be it becomes an existential uh, crisis for the planet to 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 stop global uh, warming, we need to get to and decarbonize the the uh, the industry and the economy, and the vehicle to do that is through electrify everything or almost everything possible, because you're going to have electrification of transportation, of heating, of of industry as much as possible. So electrification is the is the key to decarbonization of the economy. So it hasn't been such an exciting time for power system guys or energy people since the days of Edison, I would say. So, so this is a very interesting time and it, and I've waited like several decades to get here. So this is this is a, for, for people who are starting in, in this industry or interested in it, uh, this, is a, this, this, is a, this, is, this is a great, great entree. In, in into the into the industry and again by electrifying uh, uh, the by by generating electricity through renewable uh, and zero carbon sources you can decarbonize the the economy and thereby save the planet so the mission is that we talk about new york iso and we say we have a noble mission so i think there has never been a more uh, of a in terms of the mission and the and, and the purpose of a young people look for purpose in a company to de decarbonize the economy is, is a huge, is a very uh, um, uplifting purpose uh, to kind of embark on your career. So with that, I would just uh, talk a little bit before we go into what we are doing in the present, let's talk about how this industry evolved. Uh, so this industry is about 140 years old. So the New York City, uh, the Pearl Street uh, substation was in start, was inaugurated in 1882. It was it had 59 customers, and before that, J.P. Morgan's house library in New York City, which is the J.P. Morgan Library, which is in Midtown Manhattan near Bryant Park, was the first house to be electrified in New York City, and they basically had a generator in the basement. The guy loaded up the coal in the generator, and it ran from for a few hours in the evening provided electricity. It actually burned down uh, J.P. Morgan's library, but they, re <laughs> they rewired it and they didn't deter them to do electrification. Edison was the, was the guy who then built the Pearl Street substation. Uh, he had the foresight to actually form the utility companies, all the utilities with Edison name on it. 
Con Consolidated Edison, Southern, Southern Cal Edison in California, Commonwealth Edison in Chicago were all founded by Edison. And, and interestingly, there was this big uh, rivalry between Edison and Tesla, AC versus DC. And in the end of the day, uh, AC won because Edison was a big proponent of DC. He wanted to build his power systems in dense uh, city centers and, and have DC generator. He intrinsically thought that AC was more dangerous. At least he, he, they, had, they had IEEE meetings where they actually electrocuted uh, animals, dogs, even uh, cows and bigger animals to prove that, Edison tried to prove that uh, AC was more dangerous. But one of the things that AC did that it, DC never did was you could transform the voltage. So you could make, you could generate at one voltage and then transform the voltage to much higher levels. And what that allowed you to do is to transmit power. In fact, when you transmit power at a high voltage, you can transmit lots of power with lower amount of current. So that allowed you to save on material. In the end of the day, the economics always dictates what wins in the business world. DC power was not economical because you could not transform the voltage and you could not transmit it. So the first long distance transmission line, uh, one of the first in the world, in at least in it was in New York, 26 miles from the Niagara Falls to the city of Buffalo. So that was the first high voltage transmission line. And that's why General Electric formed in Schenectady, New York, to supply to that uh, power plant and that transmission line. So after that, that the because you could transform electricity, you could transmit it, and you could run things like motors, that was that that was why AC took over from DC. In fact, Edison, J.P. Morgan made Edison uh, buy a company in 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 Massachusetts, which had the AC some of the AC patents, and then that became General Electric. In fact, Edison was not very happy with AC technology. He left. He he he's always credited to be the founder of GE. He founded GE, then sold all his GE stock and went to Menlo Park and did inventions on phonograph and other, other things. So he his heart was into DC, not in AC. Uh, so, so General Electric was formed that AC, AC technology actually took over as, as superior to DC. And that's how the electrification of the country started uh, because with AC, you could, trans, you could transform, you could transmit. And what happened, the economies of scale, like every city had its own power plant and it was its own self-contained little uh, uh, power system. But what do you do when you have your own little self-contained power system? You need to build redundancy to keep the lights on. People found that it is easier and more economical if you interconnect with your neighbor so that you can have, when you have an issue with your one generator being out, you could draw on your neighbor's generator. So instead of two, two cities building two generators in, one at, one to supply the demand and one as a standby. You would have four generators if you were two towns with two generators each. But if you combine and build transmission, you would do by with three. So each would have its own generator and one could be a, a spare or a standby. So that's how interconnection was driven by economics. If you interconnect, you could, yeah, you could, uh, that that was more economical than being self-sufficient with with building all the redundancy. So that took off uh, when uh, with the with the electrification with the after the great you know the, after the after the uh, Great Depression, there was public works. There were things like TBA, rural electrification. So electrification really at that time also drove the economy. So what was happening is that as you generated electricity and you were interconnecting more and more regions together, you built bigger power plants, bigger power plants drove down the price of electricity. And at that time, people could afford the electric appliances. So General Electric used to make the appliances and you had the light bulbs and then the washing machines and the, and the dishwashers and the kitchen, kitchen ranges. So as you had more demand, you could actually build bigger plants and which drove the price down, created more demand. So there was a period of time from the 40s to the 70s 
there was rapid growth, rapid uh, driven by electrification and 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 that that drove the economy and the power consumption was increasing at the rate of six, seven, eight percent a year. Uh, and the large electric utilities, uh, the Con Edisons of the world and the Southern Cal Edisons and the Commonwealth Edisons, Southern companies, American Electric Power, they all formed at that time to mergers and becoming bigger, getting economies of scale. Now, of course, that party was over when there was the oil crisis of the 70s, when uh, the, a lot of these uh, large machines were running on oil, which was cheap, and suddenly oil became very expensive. Uh, we were also building nuclear plants, which were deemed to be, a lot of them, because of the nine-mile accident and so on, they had a lot of cost overruns. So larger plants were becoming uneconomic because the oil plants were not economic because the price of the oil became very high. Uh, nuclear plants had a lot of cost overruns. Initially, nuclear plants were supposed to be so efficient that the electricity would be free. The, at that time, the uh, the phrase was too too cheap to meter. So it wasn't the case after the nine mile and a couple of a couple of nuclear uh, close calls that there were a lot of regulation. There was a lot of uh, safeguards built in and a lot of delays in big projects uh, and and there was a lot of uh, ex lot of cost overruns and then i'm just trying to get get you to the markets which was which formed in 1990 uh, and 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 what drove the market so when you had the there was a real virtuous period of growth from the 40s to the 70s that stalled with the oil crisis there was this issue with uh, with large plants no longer making a lot of sense because they were they were uneconomic, uh, there were a lot of rates, and the rates were all borne by the by the customers. So the utilities were monopolies. They owned the transmission, they owned the distribution, they owned the generation. The rates were determined by the regu regulator as being uh, as being just and reasonable, but these rates. Because if you have so many cost overruns and they were deemed to be just and reasonable, in the end of the day you pay, and then it people the cost of electricity became quite high, and then there was a technological breakthrough in the form of combined cycle plants, combined cycle uh, machines blended a steam turbine with a gas turbine. Gas was a new fuel because before it was all coal and uh, and and oil. Combined cycle plants were relatively smaller. They were anywhere between 100 megawatts to 500 megawatts. They could be located closer to load centers, and they were relatively they were efficient and relatively inexpensive to build. And they could they could be built quick uh, quicker than the bigger uh, coal plants and the and the uh, nuclear plants. So, this, so the result was that. And then, uh, because of the oil crisis, there was this uh, these and uh, the the purple plans that there was a federal uh, requirement, and also the states also had policies that if you had excess power, you could be able you should be able to sell it back to the grid at the avoided cost. So there was a lot of these plans which were built to supply steam, for example, but the utility was required to buy the electric offtake at, at a long-term avoided cost, which was set as very high. At like in New York, it was six cents uh, per kilowatt hour. So there were a lot of these combined cycle plants were, which were being built, which cost less than six cents. And they were making much more, they were making a pretty good profit margin on the, on the PURPA contracts. Whereas the utility plants, because they had so much Costs built in from previous bad uh, investments, they were being passed on to the customers as wholesale rates. In fact, what was happening was the wholesale rate in upstate New York was higher than what you could build a brand new combined cycle plant. So there was this whole issue of would the utility plants become stranded? That means you have these large investments in coal plants and oil plants and nuclear plants, and do these plants make any sense now that you can build a combined cycle plant at two-thirds the cost. So that was one of the, and the utilities had all these plants in their books. And that was one of the ways uh, that they said we would adopt 
uh, markets because that seemed to be a way out of this stranded cost mess. So when we did the markets, the, the whole idea was that the investment risk was not going to be borne by the customer. So it would be borne by the developer who built the power plant. If the plant is not economic, you take the hit. If the what happened with the nuclear plants and the and was that there was a lot of cost overruns. Ultimately, it paid by the customer because the regulator allowed the utility to build the nuclear plant based on the premise that the customers were going to pay for those those plants. In fact, there was a plant in New York, in Long Island, in Shoreham, which was built for like nine billion dollars, was never really commercially. Uh, operated because it was shut down by the governor Mario Cuomo at that time because there was no good evacuation plan for Long Island and that plan several billion dollars are still in the books and Long Island customers are still paying for it so those kind of costs were no longer borne by the customer one of the premise of market was you as an investor bear the risk then there was a question of as you have competition you will drive efficiency so that was the other thing that efficiency will will drive more efficient and more economic power plants and drive out inefficient plant. It would also because the markets were supposed to be non-discriminatory, so they would not discriminate against technologies. And which is true, even we find the wind and the the solar adoption, early adoption was markets which were non-discriminatory and transparent. So it was markets allowed technological innovation and the whole idea was as you drive for efficiency, you will get environmental consumer benefits as well as environmental benefits. So that was one of the premise of the markets. And, and, and the other premise was that other industries in the 90s, the thought was that we should deregulate and get, get out of uh, monopoly arrangements. Started with AT&T, started, they started with airlines, and then uh, railways, uh, gas, and then said, why not electricity? So that's where it came to our industry. So, so that's when the market started. New York started was one of the, you know, pioneering ISOs. Cal ISO was, Cal ISO, PJM, New York, New England were the ones who who started markets in the late '90s. So one of the things we did, we did a very comprehensive market design and put it on right at once. Uh, and I called it, I wasn't there at that time. I came to New York ISO in 2006, but 1999 when New York started, they were working with Professor Bill Hogan of Harvard and others. I think they adopted Bill Hogan's uh, uh, theories and adopted them all at once. I call it the Big Bang implementation, which actually really helped us because uh, as I tell you what we implemented that time was day head market, real time markets, capacity market, demand, uh, uh, demand response and ancillary services, financial contracts, congestion hedges, we did it all at once. And it was a very, very big job. We did it in 1999. We did an actual tweak in 2005 because one of the things when we implemented in 1999, the day head market and the real-time market did not have the same transmission model. The real-time market had a simplified transmission model, uh, which was creating what we call uplift or differences between pricing and the consistency of pricing between day head and real real time. So we fixed that in 2005, but it was a it was a very ambitious rollout of a comprehensive market plan. PGM did something similar. Other other ISOs took incremental approaches. For example, Ontario even today they don't they don't have a day head market. They only a real time market. Texas was started with the real-time market. They didn't have a day-head market, uh, but they transitioned to a day-head market. Uh, so it was SPP. Uh, but once you start a market, it is very, very difficult to then make changes because money changes hands. And once money changing hands, as you make changes, there are winners and losers. So people oppose. There's a, there's usually have a vocal minority who oppose any change. And those are the people who are losing money even though the market overall wins. So one of the things that New York did right was put a very comprehensive market design right up front. <clears throat> so that uh, other thing was like, for example, we did a locational marginal LMP, locational marginal prices were implemented right off the bat. Now, for example, New England and California did not have locational marginal pricing. 
there was only one price in New England. So what happened when you give one price to in the whole region, you have all the power plants where it's easier to build power plants, all the power plants located in Maine and Western Massachusetts, whereas the load centers were in Boston and Connecticut. So what did New England have to do? They had to build a whole lot of transmission because otherwise you get a lot of bottlenecks. You could not uh, you could not transfer the power from Maine and Western Massachusetts to the load center. I know myself that I was, I know that uh, Central uh, uh, Maine Power sold their, uh, in the late 90s, sold all their power plants to Florida Power and Light, uh, the precursor of Nextera. And Nextera people were appalled to find out that the transmission rights did not come with the power plants. So they were not counting on, 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 on being curtailed. So they, the power, power plants were not as valuable as they thought they, were, uh, they would be. So, so the locational markets drive signals, gives you signals where to locate. And for example, you will locate where the prices are high. A lot of, that's one of the reasons we see a lot of cables being built from New Jersey and New England into New York, into Long Island, and New York City because the prices are high in New York City. In fact, I joke that every electron in the East Coast wants to come to New York City. That's the, because there's a lot of load and the lot and the prices are high. Now, if you don't give that price signal, there's no incentive for people to actually flow into that region or build into that region. Um, so, so, so that that was some of the lessons for for market uh, for for market design, which has stood us in good stead. And we've been perfecting these markets for the last 20 years, started in 1999. 1999 to about 2010, 2011, 2012, it was 400 power plants in New York, uh, we, which is we gave prices in 400 uh, nodes. We have 30, 35,000 megawatts of peak load and things were stable. And then from the 2010s onward, we have a lot of now renewables and distributed resources that was that, that makes life complicated. You have to change your design to integrate renewables and to integrate distributed resources. And that got put in steroids because of the state policy. So what the state policy is very ambitious. Usually California leads in that. California still leads, but I think New York and California are neck on neck uh, right now. New York wants to be the 70% renewable by 2030 and we're already in 2020 end of 2023 we want to be 100 percent carbon free by 2040 to do that the state has earmarked that we will add 6,000 megawatts of distributed solar uh, we will add like about 9,000 megawatts of offshore wind 6,000 megawatts of storage and we did simulations at iso and we said those numbers are not enough you need to build more than 6,000 megawatts of storage and you need to build more uh, wind and solar to get these goals. Uh, so that, so it's, 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 a, it's, it's, a very, it's, it's, it's a very big uh, challenge. The other thing that's what's happening is that when we created the markets, it was all about uh, pre keeping the lights on at the least cost. It was cost and reliability. Those were the two guiding, um, guiding functions. Now we have this uh, third bubble, which is not usually really priced into the markets, which is environmental, which is carbon, uh, decarbonized uh, uh, sources of generation, which is not priced in the market, still not priced in the market. So one of the things we did see when we implemented markets was it markets because of reliability and cost promoted efficiency. So one of the consequences of efficiency was that it drove out older, more polluting plants. So by just concentrating on efficiency, we, in, we actually drove uh, is, uh, SOX, which is sulfur dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, the SOX and NOX down to like 99%. We drove those down to, to like 1% of the previous level. Even <clears throat> CO2, uh, because we retired coal plants and oil plants and replaced them with gas plants, there was a very big improvement in, in, in the carbon footprint as well. But there is nothing in the markets, even today, which says 
a decarbonized source is more valuable than a carbon emitting source. We could do that with a carbon price. In fact, we did a lot of studies five, four years ago on the impact of putting a carbon price in the market. Ultimately, the regulators have to adopt it. And there's nothing in the federal regulation or in the state regulation which incorporates a carbon price. New York State is looking at a cap and invest program. So that could be a proxy for that. California has a cap and trade, which is economy wide, which, which, which is a proxy for that. What the New York State is doing is they have these credits, which are renewable energy credits, RECs, which, which is like a proxy for a carbon price or giving them what I call a handicap payment. So for example, the wind plant uh, needs X dollars a megawatt to be competitive. They get say 80% of that from the market, but New York State runs these rec programs for wind plants to make them competitive versus plants which are which are uh, fossil plants. So it's mostly the efficient gas plants. So at the end of the day, the recs are a proxy for uh, as a, recognize the carbon attribute. Uh, it is not the most economically efficient way to do it. The most economically efficient way to do it is to put a carbon price, where everybody has incentive to reduce their carbon footprint. But a carbon price looks like a carbon tax, which is not palatable uh, to to any of the regulators or the politicians. So we go through the through the route of of renewable energy credits. So the other thing, uh, what is happening is that whereas the whole markets were set up with combined cycle plans, which could which could locate closer to the load centers, so you give a price. And you could have combined price uh, cycle plants located close to the load centers, which is New York City. There's combined cycle plants located in Queens and 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 Staten Island and uh, close to the load centers. Uh, with wind and solar, there's very little you can put in New York City, unless you, which what we are doing now is putting them offshore and bring them into New York City, and so and and solar also we have to do it outside of the load uh, in, in the Western New York and Northern New York and bring it to the city. So the, again, the generation sources are moved away from the city and they're intermittent, which has got a lot of, a, a lot, a lot of challenges because uh, whereas in a power plant, you can start off, start up a power plant at will with very short notice, wind and solar, it depends on the, where the, when the wind blows and the sun shines, and you have to almost flip the paradigm where you actually dispatch generation to meet the load. You almost have to modulate your load to meet what generation is available. So the paradigm almost shifts. And then it's also a big, uh, big need for storage. So the storage one is very important. So what we see, there's a there's a there's a dynamic with storage. So if you, there's what storage is available today is the four hour lithium ion battery based storage. And the four hour came because we in the market design said, if you have four hours of duration, you get the full capacity price because our peak duration was about four, four hours between two o'clock and six o'clock, say in the afternoon in the summer. We and when we did the market design for capacity, we said storage resources can get the four or the demand side resources can get the four the full uh, capacity market payment if they can curtail demand or they have a capacity for storage for four hours. So a lot of the storage resources, batteries uh, uh, on the grid side got scaled to four, four hours. So with four hour storage, it's very good for the solar cycle. So if you, have, if you install a lot of solar, you over generate during the afternoon, you can store that, you can store that uh, over generation in four hour batteries and use it in the evening when you need it. <clears throat> now, we actually see if you if you are really going to a high degree of of renewables, you have more of a issue. You can handle the daily twenty four hour cycle with four hour batteries, but there's a seasonal imbalance because if you if you look at if you build a lot of solar, and if you build a lot of wind in, in New York, you'll build more uh, wind than solar. The wind is blows more in the winter months than in the summer months. So what we see that is that where the solar is kind of constant, 
the wind there's over generation in the winter months and the spring months and there's under generation in the fall months so there is a seasonal imbalance so if you build more solar and more wind to get the <clears throat> to actually cover that summer period as well because you what you would have is more of an imbalance in the in the in the winter so there's more over generation and you basically have to spill wind unless you have a long term storage even in the best of circumstances, we see there are periods of time, anywhere between a couple of days to a week, where you might have a period of, of less renewables because it might be an overcast for three days or it might be there's a wind lull for three, four days. And then how do you, how do you store that? So there is a need for long-term storage. And we are not going to fill that need with four-hour lithium batteries because it's just the footprint would be too large to get anything from four hours to eight hours, 10 hours, 12 hours, 16 hours that we need. <clears throat> so to get, so the, to, long story sh short, so we have a need for, for long-term storage. The other thing that we think about is that this is not only you can have a long-term storage or you could have carbon capture or you could have your gas turbines run on hydrogen or renewable natural gas. So we need something which has the characteristics of a long-term storage. But these technologies don't really exist today. There are a lot of pilot projects and, and research, but there is not a long duration battery. Uh, there's, there's these uh, iron core batteries, and then there are research on some thermodynamic batteries. And there, there are research projects on hydrogen-based power plants and renewable natural gas-based power plants and carbon sequestration, but not, nothing is commercial yet. So what we say is that we can get to a 2030 goal, which is 70% renewable by building a lot of wind and solar, but we retain our power plants, the gas plants. They run a lot less, but they use to balance the system. So they are there to balance the system and you can get to that 70% goal. To get from that 70% renewable to 100% re carbon-free, that's when you need this new technology, which is going to be hydrogen or renewable natural gas or, or something like, uh, like a long-duration battery. One of, a couple of other things are happening too as you decarbonize the economy and you electrify transportation and heating. We saw that after the era of uh, oil embargo in the 70s, uh, the load growth, which was 7%, 8%, went down to like 2%. And then there was a lot of investments in energy efficiency. So the basically load growth in the last few years have been closer to almost 0%. Now, as you electrify, we are seeing the load also ticking up. <clears throat> we are seeing that New York, uh, the peak load was about 33, 34 uh, gigawatts. We know that as you our projection is by <clears throat> 2034, we are summer peaking system. And so we peak in the summer because we get all the wall air conditioners start up. As we do more and more heating with electricity, we will become a winter peaking system, <clears throat> just like Hydro-Quebec is. So as we install heat pumps into in, in New York City. So, and then as we put more transportation, more more electric cars and more heat conversion, our peak could potentially could become winter peaking and potentially a peak could double. So instead of 33 uh, gigawatts of peak, we could have a 66 gigawatts of peak in the winter. It could be worse. Uh, so that so that is the dynamic we are seeing as we in, as we as we invest more and more into renewable uh, energy, and we are doing more electrification of the economy. Our, we become from summer peaking to winter peaking and our peak load doubles from where, which is actually good for the industry because you're having more electricity, more consumption. Uh, <clears throat> but there is also a challenge in, in, in terms of how you handle the doubling of the peak while you're retiring your conventional uh, units and building more and more solar and wind. Uh, <clears throat> so... This is a couple of other factors is that we also, in, at least I'm talking about the New York perspective because that's I'm, I'm most familiar with and also I think uh, giving a flavor of the New York path to decarbonization, California, 
and, and New England and others have their own paths. But one aspect of New York is New York City today, the downstate, New York City, Long Island, Westchester, <clears throat> that generation mix there is mostly dual fuel. So it is it is very high, 89% fossil. Upstate New York, Western New York, Northern uh, New York is like 92% green because all the hydro is there, all the uh, <clears throat> solar and wind are also there. Uh, so to change that, we have to build a lot of transmission from Western New York and Northern New York down to New York City. So you will see we have actually built transmission system through public policy. FERC Order 1000 allows uh, transmission to be built through FERC tariff if it is to meet a public policy goal. So the public policy goal is set by the state. In this case, the state said the public policy goal was to unbottle the hydro in the West. So there was a Western New York public policy, which is in construction. There, <clears throat> there was a AC transmission corridor between middle of the state down to Westchester. That is the AC transmission. We are doing public policy to integrate wind into Long Island, and we are starting a public policy uh, process to <clears throat> integrate offshore wind into New York City. So New York, there was not very, there was very little transmission built from the 70s down to the 2010s. So now there's a lot of transmission being built into New York to integrate all the wind and solar. And <clears throat> going more in the in the resource mix, what we see today is that in New York, we are about 50 percent just just today. Uh, we have very little wind. We have only 2000 megawatts of wind and we have about 3000 megawatts of behind the meter solar and a very little <clears throat> of grid scale solar. So but still we have about 21 percent of, of uh, not decarbonized carbon free energy from the nuclear plants and about 22 mega 22 percent of our energy consumption is from hydro the wind and solar contribute to only about five percent so we are about 50 percent decarbonized and if you look at renewable we are only about just less than 30 now that if that 30 has to grow to 70, we have to build, and while the load is growing, we have to build a lot of wind and solar and a lot of batteries. So the state is committed to build 9,000 megawatts of offshore wind, 6,000 megawatts of batteries, and about 10,000 megawatts of, of, uh, of solar. But so that adds up to like 20 plus 9, 19, somewhere in the, we have to build about 30,000 megawatts of, of wind and solar, plus a lot of storage to meet our 2030 goal. The other thing is that we actually have to keep all our, a lot of our gas plants. There will be some that will retire, but we need about 30 gigs of gas plant to just balance the load. To meet the proxy for the long-term storage need, they don't run often, but they run when they are needed when we cannot uh, <clears throat> when when we we cannot manage the the imbalance with just four hour storage so that is one of the one of the uh, factors that that the policymakers have trouble recognizing because they feel that one of the things that's happening is that environmental rules are becoming very very stringent and getting stricter by the day so unless we say you need to have a plan for reliability the policymakers would like to retire them. So, so, but to meet the 70% goal, we need to keep a lot of the fossil fuel. And to get to the 100% carbon free, we need to have some kind of a long range storage device that we that I that I mentioned, which is like it could be long term batteries, carbon sequestration, it could be renewable natural gas, it could be hydrogen. And what we see is that our load would go from today's around 40 gigawatts of, of, of installed capacity, about 33 gigawatts of load. By 2030, it almost doubles the, our install base to meet the same amount of slightly more demand. But if you go to 2040, we would need about double the demand, but we need more than, the, again, uh, about 140 gigawatts 
of close to four times the installed base of, of, of resources because the capacity of wind and solar and storage capacity be added up to meet about 70, 80 gigawatts of demand, you need about 140 of, of, uh, of installed capacity to meet that. So we have to build a lot of renewables and a lot of storage to meet these goals. So it's it's very daunting uh, it task of, of but it's also a very big opportunity to uh, to to decarbonize the economy and we have to build a lot of transmission. So any questions up to that? Because I would get into some of the some of the market elements at this point. But just just as a kind of a view of the past and how we came to the present and how we how the resource mix is changing. There is a question in the chat box, uh, okay. Rana. Okay. It, it, it maybe it's looking ahead, but I'll ask. I'll, I'll ask the question. Lasantha Prasad from uh, Sri Lanka University of Moratoa. Yeah. Would this would this seventy percent renewable target increase the total cost exponentially? And there's another question he's posed. And what are the measures should taken to get system inertia stable stability? Okay, one of the things is that, <clears throat> uh, so, so when you transition to a high renewable system, certainly there is capital cost. But what you get is that your variable cost is close to zero because it's basically only operations and maintenance costs. Your fuel becomes zero. So you offset the high capital cost with with low variable cost. And it certainly is going to be, I don't have the numbers with me. The New York State has done a whole number of studies based on the costs. And most of the studies say it is economic to build out renewables, uh, renewables. But, it, but it is not free. The decarbonization is not a free, uh, free proposition. You have to build, you have to, you have to build a lot of resources, but the but once you build that, your 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 variable costs are are low. Uh, so what you pay for the capital costs today, and you amortize this over over whatever period of time you do, but then you 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 benefit from the lower cost. And also there is a quick question of what is the cost of not doing anything. What is the cost of carbon change? What is the cost of flooding? What is the cost of health issues? So that is, those are also in the equation uh, in terms of the cost effectiveness of building out this renewable. So yes, yeah, so that you you could do a lot of analysis on that, but essentially, if you say that it's carbon, uh, you know, the global warming is real. We have to address it. We on, concentrate more on what's the most efficient way to to address it rather than what is the total cost. Uh, in terms of inertia, uh, that is that is a concern. It is more, it is all it certainly is a concern. It is more of a concern for island systems and very small systems because the Eastern interconnect is probably one of the largest interconnected systems in the in the world. So when you have a lot of rotating mass uh, connected, you have less of an inertia problem. But if you have a small island or islanded system, you have an issue. But people are seeing inertia issues in a lot of systems, and and there is, there are there are many forums being discussed in IEEE Institute of Electrical and, and Electronic Engineers, and uh, organizations such as uh, the Electric Systems Integration Group (ESIG). If you look at that, they have a task force on on this on looking at uh, system inertia, and they are looking for things like as the power plants uh, all retire. You have to maintain uh, synchronization with just electronic devices, not rotating mass. So how do you do uh, uh, basically if you all, all have inverter-based resources in an area, can you maintain the, 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 your required frequency of 60 hertz? So there's a lot of work being done on, on grid forming technologies. So essentially, instead of you can actually put a synchronous condenser, which is just a rotating mass, not a not a generator. You can put a generator just spinning on the system, uh, giving you rotating mass and give, which gives you inertia. But there are also grid forming systems, which are inverter based systems, which have the capability 
to provide inertial like attributes so you can form the you can maintain synchronism with with just electronic devices so that's one of the areas of active research which are going on and there are companies out there uh, which are looking at <clears throat> looking at uh, monitoring inertia and, and 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 giving the proper uh, identifying areas where you need to maintain inertia so yeah that's a good question any other questions uh, before uh, Rana picks up again? Yeah, yeah, I have a question. This is, a, this is Andrew Coleman from EPRI. I have a question. So you mentioned about regulations, and um, when you go back all the way to like reading like the New England ISO report from 2010, where they talked about the nor the Northeast getting wind and all the DC connectors. Um, and then you start looking at the planning going on in New York ISO for offshore wind mm -hmm. with DC connectors. Is it is there going to be a uh, review at some point in the future, another like landmark report like they had with New England ISO to really talk about the distribution planning that really is is uh, complicated because I, I don't think the jury's all in on the environmental regulations for offshore, especially with DC connectors and and lines going out to some of the, the platforms in New England. And I think uh, a lot of work has to get wrapped up at NYSERDA in the next couple of years on the wind consortium. Is there going to be a, like, a, are, are there thoughts going forward on how that integration might take longer than what's anticipated in some of the former reports that have been put into the public space? Well, I, I, I'm not sure fully understand the question. Uh, I guess I guess I'm seeing a lot more engineering needing to get done mm -hmm. to integrate the amount of wind that is proposed right now by the ISOs, both New England and New York. You're correct. So there is a, if, if you look at where we are, I mean, if you look at, we have 2,000 megawatts of wind in New York and about 3,000 megawatts of, 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 of rooftop solar. That produces 5% of our energy needs. If that 5% has to grow to 30%, you're talking about a lot more uh, wind and solar to be built. And, and a lot of that wind is going to be offshore wind, which has how you interconnect, how do you, how do you, uh, it's all going to be uh, cables, could be H DC cables, you have inverter converters, you, you have these HVDC terminals, you got to get, you got a lot of permitting issues uh, between federal, uh, OEM, and, and then the state, and then just siting issues, there's engineering issues, there are issues with, uh, with just plain electrical short circuit stability grid forming and all of uh, all of these uh, analysis that needs to be done it takes time uh, uh what we one of the things what we do is we highlight reliability problems yeah. we highlight what it makes to keep the grid secure and we highlight market efficiencies the timeline i can tell you is very ambitious and given it took like 20 years to build 2000 megawatts now we want to build 30000 megawatts in 9 years you do the math yes but that is if the state has a policy uh, this is what it takes to get it and they are producing the you know the aspirations to build 9000 megawatts of offshore winds they have sites there uh, there are there are a couple of projects uh, offshore which 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 have which have uh, which are looking at a few thousand megawatts of offshore wind yes but but it, the engineering challenges are quite daunting yeah. Has New York ISO had discussions to consider small modular reactors in the state to bridge the long term uh, net zero plan for That's, New York? Did you say modular nuclear reactors? Yes. Yeah, that is that is that is being looked at. Yes. I'm not sure how much real appetite there is for nuclear modular reactors, but that is one of the viable technologies for uh, for what we call the 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 is something the characteristics of a of a resource that we need, which is carbon free, 
uh, to get to the 2040 goals. Thank you very much. Yeah. Hey, uh, Alex Romanowski from Lehigh, uh, Energy okay. Systems Engineering Master Student. Um, so as you have a higher penetration of renewables, um, you know, you mentioned that seasonal imbalance and that long-term storage is eventually going to be needed. Mm -hmm. How is that going to be factored into the market um, and rewarded? You know, do you think you need some sort of, you know, not necessarily a carbon tax, but a cost for carbon because, you know, all these combined cycle plants are going to offer a lot of reliability, but, um, and for a better price than long-term storage would. Uh, this, well, of course the carbon price, carbon price would be the best and most efficient way to, to integrate, uh, renewables and to, and to price the carbon attribute into the market. So there are two factors to it. One is instead of, uh, carbon price, we are having renewable energy contracts, which is essentially, I call it almost like a handicap payment. If you're not as competitive as a fossil plant, tell me what you need to be competitive and that's that's your wreck. And the New York State runs auctions and for wind plants, they give you 20 year contracts, wreck contracts, same with solar, offshore wind, they have a special one for OREX. For storage, they're writing contracts. They're, uh, utilities are required to run right contract with certain amount of storage now one so that might be a way that the so the contracts which are which are put on rate basis run like a renewable energy credit the other thing we are doing on the market and that's what i was getting to now is we act we do accreditation of resources because when it was generation generation 100 megawatt generator is in terms of how much load it can carry, the load carrying capability of a 100 megawatt generator is very close to its forced outage rate. If a 100 megawatt gas turbine has a 5% probability of being out, it can carry about 95 megawatts of incremental load. A wind plant, it has uh, basically when your wind, when you need it, the, uh, the high load periods, if a 100 megawatt load plant might have a load carrying capability of 20 megawatts, a solar plant may have 30 or 40 in the summer and very low in the winter because your peak is in the in, in the evening. Now, a battery, what we've seen is that a four-hour battery gives you about 66 or 70 percent of load carrying capability. A two-year bat two-hour battery is like a 30. Six is about 98 today, and it depends on the state, uh, the mix of the system. Today, about an eight-hour battery gets you 100 percent uh, for for accreditation. So one of the things that we are doing in the market is doing this accreditation of the resources, which allows them to be compensated based on the reliability contribution. So if you have a long-term battery, which will have a higher accreditation rate, so that would give you a market signal that you are needed. So that is one. So that's a good segue to where, where I was going. So what do we need as the market transition? So we've run the markets like for 20 years with basically fossil fuel plants. 400 generators, predictable load, and uh, and 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 very little renewable, and and demand response. So one of the things when you we did this from 2009 2010 when we saw a lot of wind coming in, one of the things we need to do is to accurately forecast the wind, because one of the, when you have intermittent resources, if you can forecast them with accuracy, you can position your system to meet that intermittency. So you. So way back in 2009, we put a, put a state-of-the-art wind forecasting system. Our, uh, our our forecast accuracy on the average is is about four percent are are better day ahead. About two percent are better uh, real time. So once you have that level of accuracy, it helps you to position your system, which is your gas plants or your batteries or hydro. To meet the, if you can, if you can predict wind, you can position your system to to manage the intermittency. So we have forecast number, a forecast and prediction for each wind plant um, in the state that that is fed to the to the NISO. So we we generate what the expected production is from the wind plant. So that was a fundamental uh, way of of managing the intermittency. 
same with solar. So when you do solar, the way, solar is more complicated because solar is not, a lot of it in New York at least is not grid scale and distributed. So we need to, we need to forecast uh, how much distributed solar is going to be. So we have to, we are not, we don't have visibility of every solar solar panel in the state. So we have to do sampling and statistical estimation. So we we do that. So we incorporate a wind forecast and a solar forecast. The other thing which is happening is that the demand, it used to be what I used to call dumb load. Now it's smart load. So dumb load had, so essentially every, the demand was a very predictable sine wave. The New York state had like a sine wave type of a demand, like, you know, your demand is high at 2 p.m. and then 4 p.m. is the peak and then it goes down at the night and it's low in the morning. And that same profile was true all the way down to your substation level because people had very predictable uh, uh, patterns. It's the, the, it's the pattern of people waking up and people going to office and people turning on the TVs and, and, and kitchen appliances. So the load was very predictable. Now we have a lot of behind the meter solar. You have people who have, we have storage in the houses. People can, we have demand response in the commercial industrial, which can tailor their demand. So load is becoming, load uh, forecasting is becoming more distributed and more complex. So the load is what we call in load forecasting terms, more non-conforming. So we have to, uh, we have to forecast the load. So in essence, when your system becomes very, very intermittent and very, very, uh, with a lot of distributed resources, the, for the, so essentially you have a lot of distributed resources, you have a lot of renewables. In the end of the day, things like storage and gas turbines, which are running on say, say hydrogen, <clears throat> these are, these are, these are going to be used to, to balance out what we cannot predict for sure. So, so what becomes very important is to predict the net error, net load forecast error. And basically is the net of your load forecast error and your solar forecast and your wind forecast. So it used to be just solar demand forecast. Now the net error is the sum of the errors of your demand forecast and the, your solar forecast and your wind forecast. And, and what you do with your net error is you, 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 the, you might have to carry amount of reserves, which is equal to your net error. In fact, in New York, our reserves were based on the largest contingency. It was a nine mile two thirteen and three thirteen fifty megawatts nuclear plant. So that was our, our it was twice of that, which was our our <clears throat> that's what we 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 carried as as a reserve statewide. But if you have nine thousand megawatts offshore wind, and the wind can cut out. How much reserves do you carry? So it's going to be based based on the uncertainty of the wind forecast and the solar forecast. So we are revisiting how much reserves you carry based on your net load error. So that's one of the fundamental things that you have a very very large scale system with a lot of renewables and a lot of distributed resources. It's very important to have very accurate load forecast systems and your net load error is going to drive your reserve needs <clears throat> so that is that that so that is, so that is one of the things that we figured out the other uh, thing what we have is that what happens in the energy market so the first thing when you put a lot of wind and solar into the system is that your energy prices drop because a lot of times the wind is setting the price at zero and solar is setting at the price at zero but but as you get more and more renewables, and you have these large, you're, you, you're not forecasting it 100% accurately. So you have large swings, the ramp times, you know, when, when the wind ramps up or ramps down, you need, to, you need to meet that with storage or you need to meet that with these dispatchable resources. During periods of ramp, you can have very high prices. And the high prices might be that I've got four hours of storage and I'm going to discharge the storage when I can get the most value out of it. And when you have a high ramp period, people will pay almost anything. So you basically pay your op opportunity cost. So you will have periods of very low price. You might have periods of negative price when you're, you're over-generating and you're burning down the transmission system, you will have negative prices, but then you'll have periods of very high prices because you're basically discharging energy limited resources uh, to meet the system needs. Uh, so, and then, then there, there's a question of, 
in the end when the when the demand has the ability to curtail its it the demand will say that give me the x amount of my price and i will go i will not consume beyond this price so demand can set a price floor <clears throat> because they have the ability to curtail the demand based on smart uh, technologies especially commercial uh, and industrial demand they will say, I will not cons uh, consume about this price because I have systems in place which I can which I can curtail my demand. So in the end of the day, uh, the, the, what, what is happening in the energy market is becoming much more volatile. Even periods of very low prices, periods of negative prices, periods of very high prices, and price being set by, by, by demand. Rather, as a price floor of what I'm going to, I'm not going to willing to consume more than at this price. Or if more sophisticated people had at this price, I'm going to consume X megawatts, and at this price, I will con consume Y megawatts, and at this price, I will consume Z megawatts. The other thing that is happening is that the ancillary services we talked about reserves. So the reserves and regulation, the the system has to be balanced every second. And the system also needs to ride through uh, uh, perturbation, which is that's why we used to carry reserves based on your largest contingency. Now the reserves are based on on your net error in in forecasting your wind and solar and load. So basically, your periods of uh, of where you are not forecasting load cor correctly, that's when the reserves come in. So. So reserves are 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 going to be a lot of times uh, are what sets the price. So the reserves, how much reserves you you carry, and what you price it at, is becomes very important. Because in in New York, we used to carry reserves based on the largest contingency. We are moving now to what we call dynamic reserves. And just think about it: if you have nine thousand megawatts of wind. Look, in, uh, injecting 3,000 in Long Island, 6,000 in New York City, you're not going to carry 6,000 megawatts of reserves in New York City all the time. You don't have 6,000 megawatts of storage to, to carry that amount of reserves. What we will do is we're going to calibrate that based on how much wind is blowing and how much predictability is there in that wind. So we, it, it would be hugely expensive to carry 6,000 megawatts of reserves around the clock in New York City. So we have to modulate the amount of reserves we need based on how much transmission capacity there is to 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 meet contingencies in New York City from outside of New York City, how much local storage resources or dispatchable resources there are, and what is the current level of wind blowing. So the ancillary and how do you price it when you're in periods of shortage. Uh, there is a lot of uh, there is a there there's a, there can be high prices, but we cap the prices in based on certain because it, and if you if you let it uncapped, it can go to very very high numbers. So we have what we call a demand curve for reserves where we cap the price. And right now, the highest price the reserves can go to New York is four thousand dollars per megawatt. But we are revisiting that to what is the price. We have several steps leading up to four thousand. And and we are looking at what what are the correct reserve price steps to get the right behavior in in the market. So that's the two things. One is the energy market becomes much more volatile. Ultimately, the load can set the price, and reserves is be, becomes very important. And question is how much reserves do you procure, where you procure it, and how much you price it. Uh, it becomes more of a dynamic process, and the price is theoretically could. You could price it at the value of lost load, which is what Texas tried to do with the 9,900 reserve price. Uh, we might go go there, but we are looking at we are looking at what the appropriate levels of pricing would be. You are certainly looking at where you procure the reserves and how much reserves you procure. Uh, then the other thing we talked about is capacity accreditation. We need to we need to value capacity resources. It used to be very simple. Uh, a generating resource was nameplate, and the and the load carrying capability was very close. Essentially, uh, the nameplate multiplied by the one minus their outage factor was uh, or loss of uh, their the outage rate was the what we call the load carrying capability. That's the approximation of that. But with 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 solar resources, 
with wind resources, with storage resources, is not as simple. So we have to calculate the load carrying capability of these resources and pay them based on their accreditation value. And we base it on the marginal rate or marginal. So if you add one more megawatt of storage, how much more road, road carrying capability uh, you get. We had a lot of, lot of ISOs are struggling with average versus marginal accreditation. Uh, we believe marginal is correct because that it, it, it gives you essentially what's the next increment of what's the next increment worth. And it actually helps the policymakers. They're looking at the accreditation values, helps the policymakers to, to give the right kind of in, incentives to bring the right kind of resources. For example, if you're building a lot of, you're giving a lot of incentives for solar <clears throat> and your solar, your peak is has now gone into the night because you build so much solar, you, your peak is now when the sun goes down. Your load has, you've just ratcheted down your afternoon peak to it's become, it's become a value, valley because you build with so much solar, but the load hasn't gone away. It comes back up, to, comes in after the sun goes down. So your, your, your peak load is now at six o'clock in the evening when the sun is down and it's winter, but you're giving subsidies and building only solar. So it's not really contributing to reliability. So our accreditation value will show your, your value for solar in the winter is zero. So maybe you should build batteries instead of storage. So the policymakers see that accreditation values and know what's the mix that will get them to their policy more effectively. So I feel that the capacity marginal accreditation uh, accreditation rate is is a very good signal for policymakers to figure out what resources is needed for the system. So the, the other big uh, area is this, I think Rudy talked about, uh, and I would, would have liked to hear what Vikram had to say the uh, last week about the distribution, uh, distributed resources. That's a very complex area where we are having a lot of distributed resources which aggregate and participate in our wholesale markets. So we have, uh, we have, and there are people like uh, uh, aggregating everything from households to commercial entities having uh, storage and demand response. And, and we have people who are like big industrials who can provide regulation and reserve services who will all participate in the wholesale market, especially for small aggregations. For them to participate in the market, <clears throat> we need to uh, also coordinate with the distribution system operator because the, we as a wholesale market operator, we can only, we only see the wholesale transmission system, the bulk system, which is 100 kV and up. We have no visibility of what's happening below 100 kV. So if you have a lot of Tesla power walls and a lot of cars, which are which are participating in the in the in as an aggregated entity, and we say we want you to do this, like you know we want you to discharge ten megawatts, but by doing so, if they overload the distribution circuits, we will have no visibility. So there's always this coordination between the distribution. We these aggregated resources offered into the market, we come up with a schedule, we have to run it through the distribution service operator <clears throat> and they have to vet it saying that I can handle it. One of the things the distribution operators have never been able to, never had had to do so far, there was very little congestion in the distribution system. You always built enough, so you never had a congestion in the distribution system. When they built this, the, the, the transformers to, to, to supply a subdivision, they never anticipated that this street will be congested because this guy has three Teslas as charging now in this subdivision. They never had to deal with that. <clears throat> so if you, once you have congestion in the distribution system, uh, distribution system operators have to build ability to manage that too. So once we say we need this resource to do this and this resource to do that, they have to check to see whether the distribution system has congestion or not before they ratify the project, they ratify the schedule. So this is a coordination between the distribution system operator and the agri and the wholesale market operator that has to happen. Uh, we are doing this. There, there can be a lot of academic work to be done because one one of the things you can you can always do it in one fell swoop. 
but I personally think you need to decouple it because there's no optimization which will which will actually optimize your hydro plant with your Tesla power wall. Uh, we are seeing things like even numerical issues where <clears throat> when when you you would dispatch a thousand megawatts power plant, but you also the regulators want us to dispatch even something as small, small as one kW. It's noise. We don't see it in the optimization. So we got to figure out what is the how best is to aggregate the distributed resources to to make the to, for the best outcome for the system. The other thing which is true is though everything that happens in the distribution system bubbles up to the wholesale system. So we see everything, but as more and more distributed assets aggregate and offer into the wholesale markets, the coordination between the distribution system operator has to become much more automated and much more sophisticated. So there is a lot of need for communication, uh, telemetering, and uh, and uh, congestion management. So the dis the DERMs, the distribution uh, energy management systems, and others are going to be very very important. So basically, on the market side, we are preparing for more volatility. Uh, the real thing driving there is the reserves and regulation. The ancillary services are really the main event now. So we need to look at where we procure reserves, how much we procure, what we price it at. In capacity, the really the name of the game is accreditation. What's your accredited value? Because that helps us to keep the lights on and also helps the regulator to figure out which resources are most helpful in the system now. And then there's a whole body of work to be done with aggregating distributed resources. So this is going to keep us busy for, for a long, long time. And again, as I started with, this is an exciting time for electricity because we are now electrifying the transportation system, the heating system, and, and, and then ultimately more and more of the industry will become electrified. Uh, and, and, and the markets, it is, it is to be just fossil plants being optimized by the ISO. So now it becomes much more complicated because we have a lot of uncertainty with intermittent resources and we have a lot of distributed resources. We have to forecast load and, and intermittent resources very well. One thing I did not mention at all is that uh, how do you how do you model load responsive? Like, you know, we did some work, simulation work of how if you, if you drive down price responsiveness down to the retail side and get get direct pricing response from the from 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 consumers what kind of effect do you get on the on, on the market we did some simulations on electric uh car owners if they got the real time price and but we know that that's one of the things that we can do to uh to balance the peaks uh, we talked about these resources like <clears throat> long term storage and hydrogen power generation and so on to balance the intermittency but if you have more load response you can do the same uh, because the demand if the demand can basically curtail itself when there's not enough and uh, not enough gen generation and increase consumption with this generation that's a much more dynamic way do of doing it than carrying a lot of uh, storage or uh, or or things like hydrogen power gas turbines. So, so essentially, uh, New York State Public Service used to have this concept called animating the demand. We are doing it through aggregation and DER, but it can be done much more directly. So that's that that's a whole uh, different uh, topic and and really is the cutting edge of the, of, I think of the last frontier of market design. So the whole animation of the demand. So I'll stop mm -hmm. there. Ask, uh, see if people have more uh, questions before before we get to the uh, end of the time. All right, uh, we have a question that's been in the chat box from Laura Marsiglia. She was a student here uh, last year. She graduated, and she's with National Grid. And so her question is: From your perspective, Rana, what's missing from current strategies to meet the CLCPA? Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act goals, decarbonization, decarbonization goals that will ensure reliability of the electric grid. Well, the goals are policy goals. 
keeping we have a responsibility to keep the lights on so has the state public service commission so our job is to point out that wind reliability is being impacted and that is becoming very very important because what's happening is that policymakers would like to retire fossil plants uh, at a pretty accelerated schedule and we have to point out that you cannot do this otherwise you would impact reliability for example uh, new york city uh, there's about up to 3000 megawatts of gas speakers are not meeting the current uh, revised rules so by 2020 uh, i think 23 and 24 there was about there was a lot of uh, several hundred megawatts which was supposed to retire and we basically said that unless you wait till there's a line that comes from hydro quebec uh, carrying hydropower into New York City, unless that line comes in, you cannot retire these gas-powered peaking plants because otherwise reliability would be impacted. So in the end of the day, it is the responsibility of the system operator, also for the New York Public Service Commission, to keep the lights on. And what we can do is to make it very transparent that what is needed to maintain reliability. And what we've done is that the reg regulators actually are listening and said that you need to keep these plants till you have this in this case it's a dc line which is bringing power from quebec or it could be till storage comes in or some other technology comes in to to meet that need before you retire a fossil so at the end of the day the policymakers have their policy but they what we can do is to have very objective analysis to say that certain actions would lead to reliability issues and certain steps cannot be taken to keep the lights on. So it's become, it's essentially, it's, we are saying that you cannot do certain things now because unless you do certain other things to meet your, otherwise reliability will be impact. It's not the most comfortable situation to be in to say that you cannot do this policy makers to meet your policy because reliability will be impacted, but that's what we have to do. There's nothing intrinsically baked into CLCC. It says the actual this act does say that you would you can defer or postpone goals to be to maintain reliability. So we have to give that objective information that this is when reliability is being impacted. The framers of CLCPA acknowledge the need to maintain reliability, but someone has to tell them when is reliability being impacted, and that becomes. Uh, one of the roles of the ISO. All right, here's another question in the chat box, uh, Rana, uh, from David Ellis from PSENG. Is there a good understanding of the difference between total generation and observ observable generation? You've said that many times. Uh, is the difference between these expected to grow through 2030? You mean that the net error kind of stuff? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And not not that <laughs> era. It's really the uh, what is there in total generation versus what you're going to really observe. R Rudy, I was thinking of uh, net metering being invisible generation. Essentially, it's going direct to load without being observable by the ISO, and uh, FERC two 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 might have other. Um, other impacts in that area. Yeah, so we 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 see that as net load. So, so you know, a lot of this, lot of the stuff, even the rooftop solar, uh, and a lot of it is net metered. In, in if it's through like a school or so on, we see the load decrease. So in the end of the day, we need to we need to measure, we need to predict what the net load is. In the case of rooftop solar, we actually are predicting what the rooftop solar is minute to minute. But in, in certain other cases, if there's a net metering happening, there are, there are a lot of demand response programs which don't go through the wholesale market. So we just observe that as a, as a reduction in demand and we have to forecast that demand. I would rather see everything being aggregated through the wholesale markets. That way we would have better observability and controllability but if they go directly to the retail, then all we see is a net load. We don't see the 
the total generation is not visible. What we see is the net load. Uh, another question in the chat box from Professor Lamed Ridd here, Lehigh. Uh, you mentioned refinement to the operating reserve demand curve to handle uncertainty. What kind of risk management is envisioned and what modifications do you expect in this mechanism? The whole uh, the idea of demand uh, reserves is, it is multifaceted. That's not, not just not the demand curve. <clears throat> we need to look at where we look procure the the reserves. So right now we procure it in Long Island, in New York City, in Southeast New York, and the whole control area. We are looking at whether we need to, as the transmission system changes and as the resource mix changes, are those reserve areas current, or do they do we need to create more granular reserve areas? So first we need to know what are the requirements and where you, you carry the reserves because. Reserves are not transferable, just like energy is not trans. In the end of the day, reserves are converted to energy. So you have to uh, recognize and the transmission limits on the reserves as well. So you need, to, you need to procure the reserves where they can be deliverable. So you need to define the reserve areas correctly. Then you need to know how much reserves you carry. That's where we talked about dynamic, uh, dynamic reserve. So we, today we carry the reserves statically. We keep the same reserve based on twice the uh, largest contingency. But then that is may not be sufficient because your uncertainty on the load net load prediction could be higher than your uh, largest twice the largest contingency. So we need to figure out the amount and the amount depends on how much transmission headroom there is and what is the level of generation of the intermittent resource? Uh, and so that's so, and that is that is based on probabilistic calculus. Determine you're looking at a prediction of the transmission uh, capable uh, headroom available and the determination mm -hmm. of what the expected uh, output is of the intermittent resource. In, in terms of if you look at the day head market and you're going to set a reserve requirement based on expected generation. Uh, in the in the in the day ahead in real time it's more observable uh, now, then it comes to the demand curves the demand curves just gives you the price signal because when you're running short of reserves you could theoretically put the reserve value at a million dollars per megawatt hours and say that hey it, it would clear at that because there's no reserve available but we put a price step the few first few price steps are cost based for example what it costs to turn on a gas turbine the last step right now we have four thousand dollars per megawatt is the step where we, we are overloading a transmission line now theoretically that step can go as much as value of lost load the value of lost load there are many many different ways of calculating value of lost load we do know that in new york city the value of lost load is prob probably quite high probably higher than the texas 9900 9, so we have to look at how how far we take the value of the, the pricing, the demand curves. Essentially, it's a cap on how much you can price the reserve based on based on the needs to drive the right incentives. All right, here's another question oh, related one, to- uh, You talked about probabilistic risk. Just for purpose, I just want to tell you that there's actually a, a, a DOE ARPA-E project called PERFORM. They were actually looking at probabilistic ways of of <clears throat> of minimizing the risk of of carrying load for the ISO, basically looking at having the having the lowest cost, most reliable system for the ISO, and also for individual players in the market. Uh, so there's a, a DOE RPE perform project that is currently being funded, uh, looking at exact risk minimization in large scale systems with a lot of uncertainty and a lot of renewable resources. Sorry, Rudy, I interrupted yeah. you. I just remember right. that. Thank you. you. Was... Yeah. All right, the, uh, the question from Libin Varghese. Uh, this is related to Laura's question. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's covered, so could you please provide your insights regarding the potential of hydrogen and contributing to New York CLCPA Goals. 
Yeah, so the hydrogen could be what we call the, 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 the same category, we call the dispatchable emission-free resources, DFERS, which are like long-term storage, uh, carbon sequestration, modular nuclear, it could be new, renewable natural gas or hydrogen. Uh, I, I know that uh, New York uh, NYSERDA has looked at hydrogen. In fact, they have several, uh, I think they have, they have had a couple of conferences and tech conferences on hydro, potential hydrogen technologies. I know worldwide there are a number of pilot projects on hydrogen. Uh, the economics are 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 still, you know, they are they are order of magnitude higher than the current price of natural gas. So the the numbers we've seen, if the price of natural gas is two dollars of MMBTU, equivalent price of hydrogen uh, or or renewable natural gas produced from electrolyzed hydrogen could be anywhere between. Fifteen dollars per MMBTU to sixty dollars per MMBTU. So anywhere between five and and 30 times the current price. So there are there are pilot projects on hydrogen. Uh, uh, and there are, again, hydrogen is complicated because there is like black, bright, brown hydrogen and blue hydrogen and green hydrogen. And But if I'm talking about creating renewable natural gas from electrolyzed hydrogen, which is the greenest of green hydrogens, you, you're talking about pretty pricey. But some of the economists I've talked to said, even if it's pricey, you only run like 100 needed for 100 hours of the year or 200 hours of the year to balance the system so that that should be fine as long as you have that capability okay. so uh, so you, you're almost up, uh, out of time uh, rana so i just have one question and uh, uh, this has to do with uh, your projection of how big the grid has to be to meet electrification demands as we look into the future, you mentioned 2x. Uh, I know some have argued that it probably is even more, 3x. You know, uh, Elon Musk, for example, he's come out with that argument, which means some of these problems about ramping up and meeting battery needs and so on would be much more acute. But what are your thoughts? Well, 2x is you kind of intuitively can say basically, you're basically backing up one megawatt of wind with one megawatt of a battery or a gas turbine right so i don't think it needs to be to be more than 2x so you're essentially backing up an intermittent resource with a resource which is dispatchable right and so i think 2x is the right number one of the things we see like you know our current resource base is 40 gigawatts but then we see that our to get to 2040 targets we need to put 140 mega gigawatts but that also includes our winter peak has doubled from say 33 gigawatts to 66 gigawatts. So it's not being just being dri uh, driven by the intermittency, it's being driven by load growth because of electrification. So, but I, the way I look at it is, it's basically you can back up one for one and that gives you double. If you have your demand to be responsive, it could be less than that. Because if you if you if your demand, electric systems are very unpredictable, they have a very terrible load, uh, utilization factor because you build a lot of resources to meet your four hours of peak. So if you could reduce your peak or you could squash your, 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 your valley between the peak and the valley, you could actually have to carry less amount of these dispatchable resources. So I think 2X is the upper bound really. Okay. Oh, okay. Good. That's why oh. I, I think I may be wrong, but. No. <laughs> Well, thank you, Rana. Yeah. This has uh, been a very engaging 90 minutes. And yeah. uh, 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 just just so I want to remind the audience, our next seminar is November 6th. It will be presented by EPRI staff. And the topic is Global Energy Transition, the Strategies and Challenges, November 6th. And uh, I'd like to thank all of you for attending and for your uh, questions. And thank you, especially Rana, for a very entertaining and uh, very incisive, incisive uh, analysis of the market in New York. Thank you. Oh, welcome, 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 Rudy. Right. Well, I really Thank enjoyed it. All. And I'm an engineer, I like slide, but I thought I'd just do it without it, like have a conversation. Right. No, it was, it was very good. I think I'll probably encourage this in future yeah. seminars. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Susan, are you there? Yep, I'm here. All right, so you finished right on the when to stop recording. <laughs>